Welcome to this talk uh, on a very exciting theme, namely the developing therapist. Um, this was originally planned as a roundtable talk at the conference in Stavanger, uh, but due to very unpredictable travel restrictions lately, we have decided to meet here uh, at this digital room. Uh, and I'm so happy that you all wanted to participate um, in a slightly different setting. Um, I run an outpatient clinic uh, with about 25 very dedicated and competent therapists. And I see this talk as an opportunity to borrow a um, handful of the foremost researchers on psychotherapy and therapist development in the world uh, to provide a few insights into how I can get my therapists to develop, uh, to grow, to thrive and also to provide a good service for the patients that they meet in everyday clinical practice. And we wanted to structure this talk by posing a few general uh, and hopefully stimulating questions to all of you um, in order to reflect on therapist development. And the first one, I think, taps into many interesting topics uh, regarding therapist development and also therapist qualities uh, by asking if a good therapist is born or made. So we'll start with you, Bruce, this time. Well, uh, let me say first how excited I am to be invited to sit with esteemed colleagues and discuss these important topics. So thank you to the uh, conference organizers, and um, uh, this should be an interesting conversation. This is an issue I've thought about quite a bit. And before I give my answer, I want to say, you know, as clinicians and people experienced in the field of psychotherapy, we often have opinions about what we know. And it's interesting that often those opinions aren't right. Okay, Mike Lambert did groundbreaking research where uh, therapists weren't able to identify their cases that were deteriorating. So some of the things that we think we know um, don't seem to really be verified by data and research. So this is one of them, I think, that uh, there is some research to guide us. So um, our therapists, born to be good therapists? Well, I don't know if they're born to be good therapists, but clearly by the time they start training programs, we can identify who's going to be the most effective therapist. So um, Tim Anderson, groundbreaking research, measured the facilitative interpersonal skills with a challenge test in the first week of graduate training to be a therapist. And it predicted outcomes two and three years later. This is a result that's replicated in Germany uh, um, as well. So here we could say that the, the um, sophisticated interpersonal skills shown in challenging environments and situations really does predict who's going to be better outcomes. Now, does that mean that training doesn't have any effect on this? We all like to believe that as trainers, and I think we're all trainers of psychotherapists, we believe our input is really, really important. But there's some evidence uh, that's a little bit disturbing. Um, for, for one, practicum students, just beginning their first uh, work with trainee or with um, patients, get as good of outcomes as uh, experienced clinicians. Clinicians don't improve their skill over the course of their careers. This is documented research. So uh, Jesse Owen um, did some research looking just at trainees, and they do improve over the course of their training, but only very little. So, you know, this isn't good experimental research to show that training is, is or isn't necessary, but it should alert us to the fact that acquiring psychotherapy skills is a very complex matter. And we have to think about um, ways that we can improve the way we train 
uh, psychotherapist. So we'll move on uh, from your thoughts, Bruce. Um, what's your thoughts on these reflections, Louis, uh, in terms of um, good therapists? Are they born or are they made throughout the development? Well, first I want to thank uh, the organizer to invite me. This is very humbling and exciting. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, I agree with uh, virtually everything that uh, Bruce has said. And, and, and actually some of the issues that he raised will also be addressed in other questions that were very insightful questions that were um, offered to us. But specifically, Liv, to, to address the, the question here, I think what we're talking there, at least my take on it, is um, what are some of the characteristics of the, of the trainees that, sh that, that, that they demonstrate uh, before they arrive to training and what are characteristics or interpersonal characteristics that actually are responsive to treatment? And, and there's some interesting research about this. There, there's a research by Ken Pope in, in the late 90s that actually asked experts say, well, what are some of the characteristics that are important um, for counselor and what are the, the characteristics that are responsive uh, to treatment combined? And, you know, there were issues such as being accepting and emotionally stable and being empathic and all of that makes sense. And, 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 and these characteristics were also replicated. We just conducted Laurie Therrickton, uh, Jacques Barber, and, and some students in my lab have conducted a study where we actually ask director of clinical training and in many training program across, uh, across uh, the U.S., uh, North America, uh, what are some of the characteristics you, you actually, interpersonal characteristics that you focused on when you select candidate? The one that are good, helpful, the one that are hindering, uh, the 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 one that were helpful were very similar to what uh, Pope and his colleagues have identified, but we also identify what we call red flags. So here are the characteristics that we think uh, people should not have uh, that we will actually not select those candidates. And I think some of these are characteristic that I think are born, such as being arrogant, narcissistic and lack of intellectual gift. And this is reminiscence of what personality researchers have called the dark triad, which is um, narcissism, Machiavellism, and psychopathy. And I think that these are characteristics that uh, most likely are born with, and we should try to be vigilant about this. Yet, at the same time, and this is in line with what Bruce has said, we also ask the uh, director of the clinical training, have you been surprised? Is there sometimes you actually have selected somebody that you thought would be fantastic therapist and turn out to be an unpleasant surprise? And the majority said, yep. And then we asked the other way, were you surprised the other way around? Which is, have you actually made an offer to somebody you were not too sure, you thought the person is a great researcher, but actually will not be fantastic clinicians. And actually, it was the reverse. You were very pleasantly surprised. And the majority of people actually said yes. In my own personal experience, one of the things that I'm most surprised lately in the last 10 years, we are accepting more and more people who are in neuroscience. You know, So they're kind of like what I call the biological nerds. They're really, 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 really smart, and they're all about neurons. And I'm always thinking, oh, yeah, right, yeah. And then frequently they turn out to be the best therapists. And more importantly, they turn out to be the, the people who will go more in clinical work than into research. So I think it is also very important uh, for everybody involved in training to have to be vigilant in terms of characteristic that may be hurtful for clients. But at the same time, I think we should also be very open-minded, be really excited about the possibility of being surprised on both sides. And I'll stop here. That's really interesting. 
uh, because it says something about uh, some qualities and traits, uh, but also the possibility that we might be surprised uh, when we get to know uh, therapists or researchers uh, for a while. Um, I'd like to move on to you, Elena. What's your thoughts on um, a good therapist? Yes. Yeah, thank you. It feels like a very uh, great privilege to be here among these great, excellent um, people and uh, to be to be uh, among the top experts in the world in the field makes one a bit, little bit uh, nervous. But um, what I what I want to say to this is that um, it's always this, this million dollar question is, are, are you born with talent or or do you train it or, or can you actually develop, which is interesting in many different branches, I would say, I mean, teachers and musicians, is, is it natural talent to be musical in this regard, to be able to, to connect well with a range of people in, in suffering and to have that broad mind and willingness to develop and learn. I think it, it would be fair to say that we do not have very good research evidence, as Bruce said, about this question, because we haven't really had enough longitudinal studies looking into people who are selected or self-select to training, uh, other than the Anderson studies. Uh, and uh, we haven't, we have some studies where people who were not trained to be psych uh, psychotherapists, but who were selected because they're highly empathic and with good people skill, communication, and they do equally well in the studies in the 70s and later. So, and that was disturbing. Do we not need training? I think that the personal factor, and we'll come back to that, is, is quite important. And the question of how, how you do psychotherapy, how you meet people, because you can train uh, professionals into becoming very proficient in terms of uh, uh, delivering techniques in, in a good way, according to the protocol or the manual or or to to be good in terms of uh, assessment and so on and of course clinicians do a range of things not only psychotherapy so we need different people in different parts of our uh, field right so but we're now talking more about uh, therapists so i would say we we've done some research into uh, therapist professional and personal characteristics and and we we try to sort of summarize and say something about with Atke Heinemann and myself that likely there is this sort of natural talent base, which would be good to, to select out, to select candidates to possess that. It's difficult. We, may, we, we do not know exactly what to look for, right? So, but, but still there is a lot of promise in the FIST paradigm, the facilitative interpersonal skills, but we'd like to capture those and then refine those qualities. So it's not an either or, born or made, but it would be good to have um, some some talent there and some not least willingness to develop and uh, a, a kind of a, an attitude towards yourself and uh, human development in general, I, I believe. Values, I think, are quite important in this field. And then to, to have good training. So maybe training doesn't really make you a much better therapist, but we could always and we will uh, look at the question, how do we actually train uh, therapists? Can we be, can we do better, basically? Mm -hmm. And that's also something we will come back to, but this is also very interesting thoughts on maybe having a talent from the start, but then also be willing to develop and refine that um, in a clinical setting with patients. Um, what's your thoughts on this, John? Um, after hearing these reflections so far. Well, hello, friends. Um, I'm glad to join my distinguished colleagues and a pleasure to join the round table. Well, uh, the rectangular screens anyway with you. So you ask an integrative psychotherapist a binary question, are therapists born or made? And I think Lee, you can reliably anticipate a response of both. So the research evidence on making or training psychotherapists, it's pretty soft, but it certainly indicates that we can make competent practitioners. 
Uh, there's probably four areas I think we can confidently say are worth pursuing. First, and uh, fundamentally, training and relationship skills. There's pretty good research on alliance building, empathic attunement, collaboration, support, motivational interviewing skills, repairing ruptures, managing countertransference. It's clear we can bring all committed trainees up to a minimum level. It's equally mm -hmm. clear, at least to me, we cannot bring them all to excellence. Uh, we can at least get them to a modicum of competence. Secondly, we're pretty good in training in specific methods, at least adherence or compliance to those methods. We get people doing competent work with manualized therapies. Third, uh, largely outside of the academy, uh, we know some personal development, especially personal therapy and self-care, can and is successfully taught. And fourth, what I'll call, for lack of a better term, evidence-based clinical supervision and consultation, such as deliberate practice. That works. And I'm not talking here about the ordinary fluff and buff that sometimes passes for supervision. So at the same time, as my colleagues have already mentioned, um, large therapist effects uh, makes it clear that some therapists are born. Specifically, they have the formative experiences, the family dynamics, the genetic predispositions that grant them excellence that most of us mortals lack. Uh, by the way, this, this natural talent is a product of training, but it's not clinical training. It's usually family training. So I always say, well, who's doing the training? Was it the family? Was it pain? Is it the wounded healer? So think, for example, about uh, Carl Rogers and Virginia Satir. They have a personal sensitivity, such keen observational powers, and relational mastery. Uh, that's probably before they even entered undergraduate or graduate training. And finally, um, I enjoy going last and then just getting to say amen in ditto to Bruce Almighty, Louis, and Elena. I'll, I'll just support the, the idea of, of uh, uh, training in family and relationships, whether attachment relationships or earlier or, or later sibling, friends uh, relationship. And I, because we say born and we, we always talk about genetics, which are very important and which, of course, have a different interactions with, with this environment. But uh, I, I quite sort of like the idea that we, we actually we take people in their 20s who have already had a number of very formative experiences and especially the, the negative, let's say, the, the more destructive traits that Louis talked about would, would I imagine can be a result of, of the destructive, dysfunctional family upbringing. And so we, we should be more clear about maybe who to avoid into our uh, training programs. I just wanted to add that as support for this idea of, of training in family. But mm -hmm. Bruce has some yeah. more controversial yeah, issues, I guess. Very interesting. So we all agree that um, the interpersonal skills necessary to do effective therapy are present to varying degrees when we admit trainees to our programs. Okay? So I think we all were in agreement about that. But what we don't do is we don't actually assess those when we admit students to our programs. How many programs actually give Tim Anderson's Facilitative Interpersonal Skills Challenge Test to students as they enter? So, Louis, you kind of alluded to that we could, by interview, be able to determine who is going to be a destructive therapist. I think I disagree with that. In personnel psychology, we know interviews are not very predictive of job performance. A uh, Schottky study in Germany showed that interviews by experts were not predictive of the outcomes. So let's um, not be so overconfident that we can sit down with somebody and determine if they're going to be a good therapist. Let's give them the challenge test. And by the way, when we talk about interpersonal skills, it's in challenging interpersonal emotional ex experiences. We're not talking about interpersonal skills, charisma, somebody at a cocktail party who's very entertaining, 
No, we're talking about when there's anger, when there's fear, when there's withdrawal, these are the difficult things to deal with. And I think we really need to, to come to the point where we say, let's actually measure those for the trainees that we admit, because that's what's most predictive of their uh, uh, um, eventual effectiveness. And, and, and if I may just live, I, I agree with you, um, uh, Bruce, but, and in fact, uh, that's not what the study, is, uh, that's not what I meant. The study is not actually saying, like, we should have confidence in the interview. In fact, 60% of the people on both sides were surprised that they were pleasantly surprised or not pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised. Uh, and I do agree that, you know, what Tim Anderson has developed is a great heuristic, and there's no reason to not be thinking about other uh, characteristics that we actually should be measuring, right? At the same time, what I would also say is, uh, from what you were saying, Bruce, uh, earlier, you know, when you were saying the issue with uh, uh, what do we make about the fact that some of the early training are doing as well as the more experienced, well, to me, that is not a surprise whatsoever because what it is, it's like there's multiple determinants of effectiveness. And one of the determinants I'm convinced is the level of engagement, the level of um, really kind of uh, being so excited and at the same time be so humble, you know, in, in line with some of the research that Ellen provided to the field, being humble and yet being so thrilled by doing this. I think I was uh, among the better time in my career is when I was early, uh, because I was so excited, so open to see what was actually is taking place, much less blasé that sometimes I fear I have become with some cases. So I, I think it's really important for us to also kind of realize that there are multiple determinants and that they, those determinants will actually vary. And whereas facilitative interpersonal skills are great, they're certainly not the only thing I think would make a great therapist at different time of their career. We should be using what Tim is doing as a model to identify other characteristics that can actually be responsive to training. So we're already into the question of training. That was the second um, more general question I wanted to ask. We're, as I said, already into it. Um, I want to hear your thoughts, John, uh, on how to train uh, new therapists in, in a good way, uh, based on what we know so far of the complex answers in terms of what a good therapist is. Well, let me quickly begin with two caveats on my comments. First, my comments focus entirely on psychotherapy training in the United States. And second, here in the U.S., we do not explicitly train psychotherapists. Indeed, the term psychotherapist is not legally regulated in any state or jurisdiction in the United States. That's because we train psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, counselors, who, of course, perform psychotherapy, but they also conduct all kinds of other activities, like conducting psychological assessments, prescribing medications, performing research, and the like. So hence, psychotherapy training competes continuously in time and priority with training in all these other activities. But to be uh, undiplomatically candid, most psychotherapy training in the United States is an abomination a travesty. Uh, to be sure, there's a few outliers of excellence, but most therapy training is woefully inadequate. And in this brief rant, let me just pinpoint a few ways. And then I think, Lee, you'll see what the natural corrective to some of these are. First, we select most of our graduate students on the basis of academic credentials, GPA and entrance exam scores, which bear virtually no relationship to clinical talent. Then we provide training that's overly academic, long on theory, short on experience. Students have insufficient experience during training and internship. They're not systematically exposed to patients of different ages, problems, and cultures. My colleagues at the medical schools just laugh and say, 
How is it you can have someone graduate who's never treated a child, an older person, a psychotic patient, a poor person? How's that possible? You can, and then when we are training, virtually no assessment or assurance of competency. Students finish when the course is done instead of when the skill is demonstrated. Then how about the training itself? Most therapy training does not capitalize on what works in therapy. There's lots of training in manualized interventions. Uh, we just finished a study in which we found that less than 20% of training programs in doctoral psychology programs begin with a foundational relationship or helping skills experience. Students routinely take courses in what professors favor instead of what they really need in practice. For instance, we published a study a couple years ago that showed students get trained in addictions if one of their professors has a research interest in it, but otherwise they get virtually no training in addiction. Um, faculty are usually selected for research productivity, not for clinical skills or excellence. Many clinical faculty here in the States aren't even licensed. And then they jettison the supervision of psychotherapy to part-time or external supervisors with virtually no quality control. So lots of grad students doing psychotherapy get out spewing lots of acronyms, ACT, MI, DBT, CBT, but little demonstrated competence in the foundational skills of psychotherapy. Moreover, unlike Europe, here in the US, the vast majority, over 90%, of our training programs do not require personal development activities or personal therapy. This despite the overwhelming positive ratings on it um, as a way of preparing therapists. So in short, or perhaps no, not too short, I find it an embarrassing abomination. It's haphazard, it's weak on experience, little diversity, mostly serendipitous stuff and failing to ensure student competence in what works most. All right, end of rant. Hey, what you really think? Oh, that was, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> that, thanks so much, John. Um, where to start? Uh, there's a long list here of things that you obviously and understandably uh, find critical in terms of uh, therapist training. Um, there are also some cultural differences here in terms of um, how the training is uh, planned, um, which themes are into the training. Um, and I recognize some of the things that you worry about um, here in Norway, um, but it's just a very good start. It seems that we have some work to do in terms of uh, making better programs uh, for therapists. Uh, but I'd like to hear from you, Louis, um, your thoughts on training after John's rant here. Yeah. <clears throat> well, John, I think that was very important to mention that we're talking here, you and I, and most likely also Bruce, from an American ethnocentric perspective. And as a Canadian, as a French Canadian, I should have said that right from the first, uh, when I addressed the first questions. Um, there's many issues that you raised, John, that are very, very important. Uh, I, I will also say, you know, it depends. And I will also want to contextualize what you said. Um, you know, and, and clearly this is a defense issue, but, you know, I have only four to five years. Somebody is coming into my lab and the person, I have four years to make sure that the person is a great researcher, uh, a, a great scholar, but that they will also be clinicians. So the list of what you provided is I think this is an agenda for an entire career. So uh, I, I do recognize that there are some, um, you know, that our training is skewed and, and there are some really important issues that we're not addressing during the master's and the PhD program. But at the same time, I think that they are things that we can do um, and that in some programs are actually doing that will that are good as a, to foster the actualizations of individuals. Now, this being said, in line with what Bruce uh, said, I recently reviewed with Michael Barkham and Andrew Page and Sue Young 
what is the evidence in the real world about training? And in line with what Bruce said again, this is not impressive. But maybe I'm defensive. Part of the issue, I think, is I'm not sure that when we're conducting research about training experience, if we have the right measure at the right time of training to capture adequate mastery of developmental milestone. So, for example, we're measuring, you know, some of the uh, level of experience of people who are in their first year, second year, and third year. And some of the dependent measures we're using is the outcome of the clients. Sorry, but when I was in my third year of grad school, I wish that all my clients were improved, but I think my supervisor was smart enough to say, this is not the only dependent variable that you should be doing. There's an issue of mastering your own skills and you will make goof and you will actually have people who unfortunately will not do as well as they should. So I think it is very important for us to kind of be thinking in terms like, what should be taking place in different developmental milestones across the career of most people and being thinking in terms like uh, also to contextualize it based on the complexity of the cases that are assigned or should be assigned to people in different phase of their career. We should foster the exposure of people in training to personality disorders, but perhaps we should not expect that in their second or third year, they will perform as well as, as uh, Marsha Linnan or some of the individual that she thinks are the best uh, person to handle personality disorder. This being said, I think we are making some, uh, th there's some trends in our fields that are bad. The thing that I'm the most worried about is I see more and more trainers who actually rely only on treatment manuals, and I love treatment manuals, but they rely mostly on treatment manual to treat their supervisee, and they themselves have been trained on treatment manuals. I think what is one of the block that is missing is to have people who are training, trainers, who actually have read Freud, have read Rogers, have read Beck in the text. They have read the, and they understand the principles, the theoretical principles about psychopathology and about the process of change, and then can take a treatment manual and really infuse in their training that type of principle. So I'm, I'm worried about this kind of link that is going from one generation to the other, where we have lost tremendous amount of knowledge from our earlier um, uh, fun, uh, people who are the foundations of our field. I'll stop here. I, I, and, and I do believe, though, however, in, in reaction to what John said, that there are ways to actually address some of the problems that you mentioned. But, but frankly, I think you were also unfair because you're talking about an agenda for an entire career, not for four or five years. Very interesting. Thank you, Louis. Uh, you talk about a lot of things, um, not only the themes for the training and um, how one could, for example, uh, present different kind of clinical cases, but also um, reflecting on the timeline in the training progress. Um, Helena, you work at the university in Oslo, and I know that you meet students um, a lot during your yes. work. Hmm. Um, what's your thoughts on therapist training well, in this I'm, context? I'm, um, I, I was quite relieved to, to hear John in the sense that not everything is better in the US. Uh, I believe that uh, we do more of what John is, is actually missing in, in, in the programs over there. So, um, and we've changed quite a lot lately. We have not so many places where we train clinical psychologists, which I know more about, of course, than medical school and, and uh, for, uh, clinical social workers and nurses. So bear with me on that one. But, uh, but also uh, I know something about a, a more private uh, institutes as well. 
but to to along the, the way train uh, practice or relational skills all along is something that we started with some years ago. So it, rather than waiting till the end, we do that all along and we have uh, much more focus on professional or personal development and role play, experiential learning, early practice experience covering the range. Uh, uh, we, we, we need and we, we have our students practice with children, adults, elderly and so on, all, all, all the range. If not in every single case, I can't uh, sort of promise that in, in behalf of all Norwegian institutions, but that, that's the goal and it's very much uh, uh, part of our uh, goals in, in, in training. Um, and I think the, John's book, books and impressive work have been very inspirational. I mean, his volumes on psychotherapy relationships that work and therapist responsiveness are extremely important. So they, we take that knowledge uh, along with all the empirical evidence that his authors and himself present and, and of course Tim Anderson studies and we've adopted that into a Norwegian context uh, and we do that as we speak. So, so I think that has actually um, um, made it to, to, to Norway and into our programs. So that there's a change, much more integration between theory, practice and, and the different sort of uh, uh, domains to cover. Interesting and also giving a sense of hope in terms of uh, the possibility to also to change the training uh, based on important theoretical work and also research on what's important um, for therapists. Um, what's your thoughts on this, Bruce, um, after hearing these other reflections? Well, as usual, I have, have lots of thoughts to, to say about this. You know, it's interesting. We talk about uh, um, are they born or are they made? And that question is really prominent in the area about expertise. There are people who study expertise, and there's a debate. Uh, Anders Ericsson believes it's deliberate practice. Um, there are others who say that it's personality, grit, um, and some natural talent, uh, genetic natural talent. But what we can learn by examining that expertise literature is that we do a very poor job of systematic training, okay? We talk about it, knowledge and exposure to these kinds of patients and so forth, but do we actually talk about practicing a particular skill in a particular context over and over again? Look at Rafa Nadal. You know, when he practices on his day off at Wimbledon, he's practicing every facet of the game. When he lost the Australian Open, he says, what do I have to do? He's the best tennis player in the world. I have to go home and practice. We don't do anything similar to that in either the United States or, Helena, I'm sorry to say, in Norway, which I have some experience, in that really systematic way. So if it's an empathic response with a personality disorder challenging patient, you have to practice empathic response in that context with feedback. We don't do anything like that. We give some training in interpersonal skills, in manuals, go see your first clients. John, you said something about supervision uh, as being, uh, I can't remember your exact language, but it was, it was very articulate. Supervision, the way it's practiced, is not anything like the way a coach works with uh, a, a performance athlete or the way musicians practice and get feedback. What we do, I think, needs dramatic change about how we build the skills that are necessary to do um, more effective therapy. And I, I want to qualify that and say, you know, as therapists, we do a pretty good job. If you look at outcomes uh, uh, in practice, um, we help patients. So I'm not saying, uh, you know, we're a terrible field or we got to get better. We're doing a lousy job. I'm not saying that at all. But if we want to get better and improve outcomes, 
uh, at the population level. We have to deliberately practice the skills that we know characterize effective therapists, and we can get better if we do that. But we have to give up some of the adherence to the to the models we use in training now. We need a dramatic, different way of training therapists and improving over the course of our careers. How many of us actually do any deliberate practice after we're credentialed or licensed and we're practicing? In some venues, you have to have lifetime supervision, but it's, I've seen the supervision that's done. It's great support. It's great to have someone there to talk to about difficult cases. But it's not the kind of practice uh, Nadal uses to get better all the time. Or Pablo Casals, when he's 80, someone asks him, why do you practice four hours a day? You're the best cellist in the world. Because I think I'm getting a little bit better. We don't do that. We need to change fundamentally how we get better in psychotherapy. Actually, quite powerful words. Uh, the need for a dramatic change. Um, I, I'm really happy that I posed that question. Uh, it also makes me uh, want to expand on that theme. But we'll try to move on. Um, and we're moving on to the last question um, that actually goes uh, back to um, training in a wide term. Um, we were talking about um, the familiar training or the training from the family system versus a more uh, professional training. Um, and I'd like to move on to this balance or um, separation, if it's possible even, between the professional and the private life um, for therapists. Uh, and if it's possible or even desirable to make that kind of um, separation or draw that line, um, and I want to hear your thoughts first, Teliana, on that one, because that also taps into uh, training and development for therapists. Mm -hmm. So, so whether to whether it is possible to, to separate, to distinguish in a good therapist or, or not a good therapist, whether that depends on his or her professional skills or qualifications or more personal. Uh, uh, issues or features or attitudes and so on, right? Yes, um, I, I believe that in our field it's, it's even more than usually intertwined. But then I talk to all other uh, people in different professions and they say the same thing. Although, of course, people who treat or, or uh, examine dead corpses, they are the only ones who said, well, it, it's the professional skill. Or, I mean, to, to, to endure it, of course, you need, you need some personal abilities, I would imagine. But mostly if you talk to teachers or people who, who work with other people in any kind of uh, way, to, to want to, we, we try to uh, uh, facilitate development in someone else. And the same is the case for many other professions and who we are as persons, how we do that, relationship skills can make an, an enormous difference. And doctors, of course, nurses, uh, kindergarten teachers, you name it, right? Salespersons and so on, uh, interviewers, uh, judges, and yeah, I could go on. So I'm not, I don't think anymore that it is very particular to our, our field, but uh, of course that the, the, the skills that we teach are much, uh, or I would say in, in, in my university now, not so much uh, about uh, the, the sort of clean cut professional skills, but also taking into account personal aspects and, and, and interpersonal skills. But they are they are also professional in the sense that you are, it's not only as someone said here, it's not just being able to connect with people at a party or an airport or in a crisis, uh, whatever uh, you know, in a in a natural uh, crisis, what well, you need people to stay calm and manage well. So it depends on the task of the situation. But therapy has some; it's an asymmetrical relationship. So that ability to to let the other person be in the centre, even if whatever happens in the relationship or in the therapeutic work activates quite a lot in you. 
So that's a very a good example, I think, of a combination of uh, professional and uh, personal capacities. And uh, Tim Anderson's studies show that the focus on the client when the going gets tough, when you are criticized, when the other one is, has a lot of fear or is very avoidant, that capacity to, to respond in a way that's, that is uh, res responsive to the need of the client takes, of course, very uh, both professional and personal uh, skills that, that merge in a way that, it, that, that in a way makes the distinction less relevant, maybe. But, but we still need a lot of, I think we need to, to train those capacities and they are trainable as to what, if, if maybe as well adding to, to what Bruce said, if we do training more in the sense that, that these great guys uh, suggest. Um, but I, I would also say that um, the, 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 uh, when we talked about uh, programs, uh, we, we did not mention one important difference, I think, which has to do with um, this, the, the healthcare system. I just wanted to add that because I think it's, it's easier in Norway to, to have uh, our students practice in different fields because of our healthcare system. So that gives an opportunity to, we know we have had lots of people from the US, not least Bruce, coming to Norway to, to do research because the system is quite good, Bruce, in terms of allowing for psychotherapy to be given as treatment, treatment for mental health disorders across the range. At least that's the, the it, it's, it's not perfect, not at all. But so there is more access to places to practice your skills. I just wanted to add that, but, mm. but to your question, Liv, it's, it's very much, uh, it's difficult to separate, but it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting, uh, let's say, intersection between the two domains. Yeah, that's um, one Long point answer, that, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 good, good answer and long answer. And also uh, fitting to the question itself, you can't answer that kind of complex question in a short way. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts, John, uh, on that uh, balance or intersection between the professional and private uh, among therapists. Well, because it is so complicated, uh, Liv, my response to the question is an unqualified, definite, it depends. Um, so the person of the therapist is unavoidably, inseparably uh, connected to the process and outcome of therapy. It's a clinical and research fact, it's a reality. In fact, the publications of my three esteemed colleagues here attest to that. Therapist effects, emotional functioning, outcome, therapist contributions. So to put, put it in a nutshell, we're a profession where we, the psychotherapists, are the therapeutic tools. And what tool does not get chipped or dull after time? Uh, that, of course, speaks to the urgent need for psychotherapist self-care, a particular interest of mine over the years. Nurturing the person of the therapist, quay person, uh, tends to result in better care. Uh, there's not great randomized clinical trials on this. Uh, it's pretty soft research. But I'm convinced, uh, friends, that improving yourself is one of the best effective means of improving psychotherapy outcome. At the same time, and in no way contradictory, there are places where it's both possible and desirable to separate the personal from the professional. A few examples, setting proper boundaries with patients. We better separate. Uh, reducing the amount of our negative counter-transference leakage on our patients. Please, let's separate the personal and the professional. Or differentiating counter-transference reenactments from real relationship re reactions, uh, leaving your occupational worries and difficulties at the office, not taking them home with you, and blurring that work-home boundary, Culti cultivating meaningful friendships outside um, fellow mental health professionals. Um, in our research on psychotherapist self-care, we see this time and time again that many psychotherapists surround themselves 
only with mental health colleagues. And they literally can't get away from work. Um, so that surprised me over the years. So to conclude, the personal and the professional are indeed largely inseparable in psychotherapy, but they must be separated on occasion for both patient benefit and practitioner health. Excellent. You give uh, a very clear answer to um, a very complex question again, but also expanding on it depends, but it depends on what you talk about in terms of therapist um, therapist processes and also therapist um, development. Um, your thoughts on that, Louis, um, after hearing these reflections? I don't have much to add. This was very insightful from uh, both Ellen and, and John. I guess one way of answering the question would be, how can we and how can we not um, to separate? I think to me the key is why uh, so I remind myself, I'm a, I'm a behavior therapist at one level. Doing functional analysis to behavior is very crucial. So why, when, and how to use, and the use here is, is very, very generic. It's not only behavior, but it's also um, addressing the, the, uh, our own internal experiences. So why, when, and how we use personal knowledge and experiences. Um, we, I think we have some guidelines there. Some of them have been mentioned by both Ellen and John. I think in terms of research, uh, we have some guidelines with regarding to the management of contra-transference, uh, self-disclosure, you know, not too frequent, not too confrontative, and metacognition. So we, we have the work of Jeff A., Charlie Gelso. We have the work of Clara Hill. We have the, well, the work of... Jeremy Safran, Chris Moran, Catherine Eubanks. This is very, very helpful. And we also have, you know, key conceptual and clinical con uh, concepts, such as uh, Sullivan observations and participation concept. Uh, Gene Watson and Les Greenberg wrote a wonderful chapter in a, in a book that was published in the early 90s, um, by, uh, by uh, Adam Orvat about the Working Alliance, and they talked about the enactment of empathy. Uh, I thought this was a great way of being able to use uh, our experience, not only by what we say, but what we do with clients that embody the empathy. And I also love, this is a paper by um, an author, his name was Omer, published in Journal of Psychotherapy Integration, really early, early 90s. And he talked about, made a persuasive argument that the best therapists, in his view, were therapists who were able to shock their client, uh, to really kind of get them to get unstuck by doing something uh, in their way of, of relating, uh, by, by, in the way of what they're saying, that would actually shock the clients. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, but, but how and when and why to shock those clients is, is also really, really, really crucial to actually know that. And I, I, oh, the one thing that I would add to, to John, uh, here, the issue is, you know, when you're talking about self care, I would actually <laughs> say it depends. And what I would say is, I think the issue should be more about the process than about the actual states of where the person is. So if I can allow myself to do some self-disclosure, I think I'm a better man. I think I'm a better person when I'm a little bit depressed. I tend to be way more understanding to other people, way more tolerant to other people. I think I'm a much better therapist to work with depressed people when my BDI is not 10, but just a little bit about. Now the key to me is when I get there, what do I do in order to feel better, to suffer less, to relate better with um, in my environment? But I also think that if we just focus on being totally healthy, exercising, playing piano, reading Victor Hugo, drinking the best Bordeaux, cooking the best meal, <laughs> doing everything, we also kind of recreate the Smith that um, uh, just being healthy uh, at the top of the Maslow Pyramid 
uh, is the only way of doing. So a little bit of depression, I think, goes a long way. I'll keep that in mind, Louis. <laughs> Thanks you. Thank you so much uh, for uh, very interesting and also expanding the theme a bit. Um, Bruce, you'll have the chance to have the last words Great. on this. Thank you. These topics. Yeah. Well, I think the thing I agree most with the speakers is about the Bordeaux. So uh, we definitely should have a glass of Bordeaux to, Bordeaux to celebrate this. So I don't know if it's my personality, but I'm going to uh, uh, take exception to our field's focus on personal development. I think we way overdo the need to examine the, the personality structure, the mental health of clinicians. Um, and I'm going to tell uh, uh, an example of where I think this is illustrated. I was doing group supervision uh, with, uh, these were advanced uh, uh, counseling psychology students about to go on internship, so pretty experienced. Uh, every week, you know, just the way we usually do it, present a case, we'll give our opinion about the case. So this student presented a case, um, and it was with a difficult patient, personality disorder, wasn't making much progress. but. I'd like to know about a particular interaction. We didn't have videotape, but tell me the most difficult interaction you had with this patient. So she's presenting what happened. The, the patient said this, I said this, the patient said this, and it was pretty clearly she made a statement that sounded critical of the patient, okay? And everyone in the class, the other, uh, students and I recognize this is a therapeutic error. And when she said it and she saw the reaction, you could just see shame crumbing across her face. I did something wrong. And I, this is when I was becoming uh, uh, quite uh, uh, enamored with deliberate practice. I said, you know, this is a difficult patient. This is a difficult interaction. Being empathic, with this patient, when they're challenging you, it's very difficult. There's nothing wrong with you. This isn't some personality defect that you have that you couldn't be empathic in this situation. It's just a difficult skill. We're going to practice four or five times what you should say and how you could be empathic with this patient in this particular. Now, there's some internal part of this. You have to kind of feel the difficulty this patient has in their life to, to be able to express the empathy. So I'm not saying your internal reactions are unimportant, but this idea that there's some defect and that she needs to go to therapy so that she can be more empathic to patients like this because it reminds her of someone in her family. No, just practice the skill that's needed empathic with a difficult, challenging patient at this particular context, and you will get better at doing it. And she was so relieved that we weren't going to analyze her personality in order to understand why she couldn't be empathic in this situation. And it changed the way I thought about this. So let's practice the skill. Now, maybe if you can't learn to be empathic, with a, a, a person with borderline uh, features, then maybe, maybe we should examine uh, uh, countertransference and personality structure. But the first uh, uh, option is practice the skill in a particular context and master it. So a little bit different take on the separation of, of uh, personal work and professional work. Thank you so much. Uh, I think this also reflects um, the need to uh, acknowledge that we, as therapists, also work with challenging patients. And uh, in addition to all the important personal qualities and relational qualities, we also need skills uh, to, um, to meet them and to um, relate to them in challenging situations. 
So I think this was a very nice uh, roundup in terms of, again, keeping up the complexity, um, but also acknowledging, acknowledging that this is different than a cocktail party. You need to have a lot of theoretical knowledge. Uh, you need professional training in terms of um, knowing uh, that the therapeutic process is a lot different from what we, how we normally encounter people in social contexts. And then we also need a lot of systematic training, um, skills, uh, therapeutic models, etc. Um, but I think this talk um, also kept up the complexity in terms of uh, training within a professional setting, uh, but also keeping in mind that we need students that have lived a life before they come into the program and that a lot of predictors are there already from the start at the training. So I, th I see the time uh, closes up or have closed up a while ago, uh, actually. So um, I'd just like to t thank you all uh, for such uh, an inspiring and stimulating and fun talk. Uh, which was what we were aiming for um, from the start. Um, I'll definitely take these uh, reflections back home to my clinic um, and keep working with my excellent therapist group. Um, and I also want to mention that we'll have the pleasure of listening to your plenary talks uh, that will expand a lot of these uh, themes at the conference. Um, so thank you. Thanks again, and also thanks to the audience uh, for listening. So thanks again. Have a nice evening and day where you are. And uh, to all of you listening, um, I hope you'll have a nice conference in Stavanger uh, further ahead.